This episode of the After Action Review Podcast is brought to you by the Java Can, an all-in-one ruggedized coffee brewing system designed by a green beret so that you can make a fresh cup of coffee anywhere from your backyard to a mountaintop in Afghanistan. The Java Can will brew you and your team a fresh cup of coffee no matter where life takes you. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. That's thejavacan.com. Use promo code AAR. Get your 10% off. Live life charged. Folks, the latest book on my must-read list is one that honestly might save your life. It's 365 Days of Survival by the folks at Captive Audience. This book has 365 days of tips and lessons of survival from people in the special operations world, law enforcement, and survivors. These tips span from wilderness to urban survival, natural disasters, and crisis planning. Be a force multiplier. 365 Days of Survival is available now on our website, theaarpodcast.com. Fortune favors the prepared folks, so don't wait to wish you knew what to do, know what to do with 365 Days of Survival. Go to theaarpodcast.com, scroll down, and order your copy of 365 Days of Survival today. All right, folks, welcome to the After Action Review Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Rodriguez, and I have a cold. You can probably tell by the sound of my voice. It's a little nasally. It's a little stuffed up, maybe. I don't know. I think I sound like I'm talking underwater, but uh, the show will go on. So my guest today is Army veteran, comedian, and entertainer Dion Flynn. You'll know him from his appearances on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, where he's best known for his uncanny impression of President Barack Obama. Now, I met Dion after attending his storytelling workshop through the Armed Services Arts Partnership here in Washington, D.C. The workshop was pretty great. I was there to not only learn how to tell a better story, but to also help my guests put their stories into a format that they can easily talk through, and I feel like... I walked away with exactly that, but I also walked away with a profound respect for Dion. Throughout the day, he shared a lot of himself with this group of strangers. He shared with us stories of a not-so-easy childhood, struggles with addiction, of a life finding his own personal truths. And I got to tell you, that's a lot for any one person to feel comfortable talking to someone that they trust, much less a group of strangers. But those stories were meaningful, and they made us all feel more comfortable with the stories we were sharing. Some of us told funny stories. Others told stories of fear, sadness, lost love, and others about the lies told about dill pickles. So before we begin, I want to share with you all a quick story about how a world-famous comedian made me cry. You see... My kid is funny, and I mean that he's actually hilarious. Now, I'm not just saying that because he's my kid, but because I think the kid is legitimately funny. My son Merrick is 17 years old. He's tall, lanky, and likes his hair long enough to be slightly rebellious, but short enough to keep me happy. Now, ever since he was a little boy, he wanted to make people laugh. He would make silly voices, tell those dumb kid jokes about interrupting cows, the kind of stuff that gets less cute as they get older. But he was persistent. When he was 13, he told me he wanted to be a stand-up comic. Now, I've been an army guy for almost 20 years, and I'm no stick in the mud. But I'm also not exactly sure what to do with a kid whose goal it is to do stand-up comedy. When I heard those words, I saw a future of smoky nightclubs, sleeping on dirty couches, and a potential drug problem. He would might as well have told me he wanted to be a bum when he grew up. I tried to talk him out of it. I suggested other careers like 
engineering, law, or even the military. For the love of God, I even suggested being an actor. Anything but a stand-up comic. Through all my gripes, complaints, and attempts at steering this kid in a different direction, he stayed on message. I want to be a stand-up comic. He watched Netflix comedy specials, YouTube comedy, comedy podcasts. I caught him even stealing bits here and there, but when I recognized him telling someone else's jokes, I called him out on it. Little did I realize I was actually encouraging him to write his own material. I didn't know how to properly encourage this goal of his. I don't know a lot about comedians, how to be successful in comedy, or what kind of future he could build for himself as a comic. I needed expert advice. So there I am at the end of this storytelling workshop with the famous comic Dion Flynn. When it occurs to me, here's the expert. I'll ask him for advice. But first, he needs to see this kid do some of his material. Maybe Dion will be like, Rod, this kid is terrible and he should focus on being an army ranger. So I asked my son to do his own Barack Obama impression, which I've always thought was actually pretty good. But I'm talking about showing this to a world-class comic whose Barack Obama impression is tonight show funny. So he'll know if my kid has the chops or not. I go up to Dion, phone in hand, with a video of my son's impression. I explain the Merrick situation, ask him to check out the video, and he does. He smiles and laughs as my son does his Obama and looks at me and says, he's pretty good. He sounds pretty good. Now, I'm happy, of course, that someone of this caliber thinks that my son's impression was pretty good. So I ask Dion if he has any advice for me in helping to support my son's goals. I was expecting a pep talk or maybe some fatherly insight. Instead, he says, can I borrow your phone? I said, sure. And he proceeds to record a special video for my son. And he tells him, how good the impression was. And he encourages him to write his own material and write it down to practice. And above all, not to let anyone, anyone, discourage him from pursuing his dream. Dion didn't have to make that video. He didn't have to take time to encourage a stranger's kid. I stood there watching this remarkable act of kindness and generosity. And I learned a lot in that moment about how to be a better father to my own son. And that was when a world-famous comedian made me cry. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, the amazing Dion Flynn. You have lived a remarkable life based on what you shared with us mm. from a trailer park to Hollywood as a young, as a young person, not even as a young man, just as a young person, yeah. um, to the military to, and, and, and there's like this giant gap in my, in my thinking here of where you've been. And then all of a sudden you are on the Fallon show. You're out there, you're Barack Obama to so many people. Uh, you've taken on so many characters. You are a a uh, well-known comedy uh, person, a, co a comedian, a comic, if you will. So take us back. Let's go back to that that trailer park. I'm sure that'll get edited out. That's one of those Warner. No way. You know those Warner Brothers music things they do, those little interstitials to set up of some bucolic yep. country scene? That song is one of them. I'd like to know the title of that. Get at me, Warner Brothers. Yeah, right. Um, what, well, the, you know, the trailer park. You know, when you're telling stories, you have these places that are specific backdrops um, that won't go away. There are places in time and space. For me, the Army, when I lived in other countries, some of those are real are backdrops I keep visiting. The trailer park is definitely one that I almost believe like it calls a certain part of your soul back to it until you finish the business that you were put there to do. There's lessons that you were supposed to learn from whatever life I had. 
and I had a certain set of cards dealt to me. I was African American, Irish, and Italian. My mother was an Italian white lady who looked like she looked like Pocahontas. I mean, she looked like she was tall, thin, white, but Italian, you know. And uh, I had this white father. You know, if you flashed onto my life at one moment, age two and a half, three years old, four years old, moving into the trailer, you'd see this white family, two parents, and this one brown child. And then you'd see these white kids in the neighborhood. And you, you know, if you cared to question it, you'd say, what the hell's going on here? How did this happen? Well, I was asking that question a lot because I didn't know why we were a blended family. Now, today they have these... Today, in the days of Venmo and transparent offices where nobody, you know, nobody's hiding anything, we have phrases like blended family. People understand more nowadays with the Internet and world cross pollination. But back then we didn't. And it was just like, why are you brown? Mm -hmm. Why are you brown? And the kids wanted me to go inside and like find out, you know, with this kid, Bobby literally said to me, (laughs) you better go in there and find out. (laughs) <laughs> we want we want answers. We want answers. And he was waiting out outside the trailer for me to go in. And I asked my mom, I said, Mom, the kids outside like want to know, like, what is going on here? I didn't I truly here's my youth. My yeah, you're innocent when you're young. I, I didn't even know that anything was out of place until the kids started telling me to go in and find out. So these kids wanted official press release from your mother on the condition of your brownness. That's exactly right. And I almost came out like Barack Obama, like, uh, first of all, now look, I've, I've asked my mother for some answers. And uh, <laughs> this is our, this is our, our press briefing. Uh, first of all, I, she doesn't know who my real father is. And she didn't really want to go into it. So can we just drop it there? <laughs> so basically, I came out and was answering these kids' questions with vague information that she could you know she was 19 when she had me so she just wasn't capable of processing and she's trying to answer uh, these questions coming from her kid her kid who's who's, still a kid who's five now six and he asks like once a year you know it's like an annual thing i'd like get the courage up to ask and then she'd break into tears and then we'd drop the topic for a while that kind of thing so what that left me with was a sense of it, it, it affected me in a lifelong way in a couple of ways. One is I really learned to let go of the past uh, in terms of holding any one person accountable to how hard it is to be on this planet, because it's not my mom's fault that life is difficult and I don't blame her for what she chose to do. It affected me in the sense that I will pursue the truth in conversation and in my dialogues with myself, with other people. Um, I'm learning now to back off of my interrogation techniques um, and let people have secrets and privacy. This was something I struggled with for a number of years. I was like, if it's the truth and we haven't gotten to it, then you owe it to me. But you don't. No one owes me the truth. But if you want to get down to it and really explore the truth of something, I will be there with you toe to toe like lawyers preparing for a big case. With a- yeah, So this early childhood feeling of you owe me the truth kind of just is stuck with you into a couple of years into your adulthood where you're still looking. You feel like people owe me the truth. So you're you're this kid and you're going through some some tough times as a kid and it's funny because I didn't have the best upbringing as a child either but it doesn't seem that way when you're a kid it just seems like well that's just life you don't really get to compare cards until you're a little older and going oh wait a minute like families go and do that and you don't get yelled at for that you don't get beat for that oh oh dude what was I living right so you don't know any better you don't know any better so did were, were you funny as a kid is this something that developed later I was always funny. My mom was funny. My mom, it doesn't come out in what I've said so far, but she was hilarious. My mother and I, here's my mother. Okay, this is so stupid and you won't be able to get this in the podcast listening world because it's a visual. My mom would do this with her lip. I can't even really do it. She would just go like this. It's so stupid. I'm going to like lower my top lip a little bit to Rod. It's not that funny, but I'm going to do it. She used to go like this. She used to go. (laughs) <laughs> so stupid right and it it's like would, this weird upper lip wave thing yeah it was like yeah what <laughs> it would destroy me it would destroy me in church um so these are our big laughs there was that 
there was my mother sneezed and farted one time in church at the same time and uh she, and we died we just died over that um then well, she karate chopped me in the throat one time. <laughs> she was she was mad at me because she was like she was assuring me that if I went with her to this thing, whatever it was up the street, I, it would be fun. And I, she was like, "It'll be fun. It'll be fun." You know, and she never really asked me to do stuff, so it was it was it was a risk for her. I see now. She's she's been dead for a long time, and but now I can see that it was a risk for her to encourage me to come to this thing that she was tentative about anyway. And at a certain point I said, you know, is this the fun part? And she just chopped me right in the Adam's apple. Oh my apple, God. Right in the Adam's <laughs> apple. That shouldn't be funny because you're a kid. It you is funny though, it, but it's, it's funny. <laughs> Karate chop to the Adam's apple is funny. It's, you know, it's abusive, right? But abuse plus time is like, you know, you can deal with it. You know, it's yeah. perspective and it's, it, my mom threw the turkey. She was, she weighed probably 120 pounds at the most, you know, um, and she threw the turkey one Thanksgiving because we asked a question, because you know? <laughs> me and my dad asked a question when we shouldn't have, you know, or whatever it was. She threw grass shears at my dad one time. She was just, she was dramatic. She was all over the place. And, um, but she was funny, man. Like she loved to laugh. I actually think that look, I'm 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 a former I'm an addict who's in recovery and that's a big part of what I do and I work with recovering people and I lead workshops, improv recovery workshops at at the major rehabs in the country. And I actually think laughter is probably addictive. It probably fits into the model of copping and people get together in comedy clubs in the same way they get together in opium dens for laughter. They just want the laughter to happen. And I think something's being secreted in the brain. I'm sure somebody's done a paper on it. And there's a lot of the drug-seeking behavior that I see in, in comedy nerds and people that really love comedy. The same behavior that I see in you know people that really want a drug really badly. So I think my mom was really interested in that. And we were interested in escaping the realities of our situation living in a trailer, it's 14 feet wide, 66 feet long. Um, we have roaches that are there because of me. <laughs> I, I brought the roaches to the house. I didn't want to eat, I wasn't, I only wanted to eat sugar and Doritos and Frosties. And so they would make me like food sometimes. And my mom tried to make Mugu Gai Pan once, which is like a pancake with like vegetables in it. Yeah. It didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> and so I left the table and I went down the hallway, went into the spare room and dropped the food into the drawer and hid it. Um, and then I, I said, well, this is a good way to get rid of food that you don't want. So I started doing that with, with cereal that I didn't like, puffed rice I didn't like, poured that all in there. And it was a room nobody ever went into. So you do that for like six weeks. And eventually all the roaches in Maryland come to your house. Because <laughs> they're like, something's going on over there at 1114 Chipper Drive. We got to get, that's the spot. Oh, that is shit. the spot. You smell what's coming from, you smell what the rock's cooking. So from Trailer Park to the Army, what compelled you to join the military. I had quit high school and I wanted to finish something. I, I, I felt it in my heart when I quit high school and ran away 2,900 miles from Maryland to California. I could feel that I had quit something and that I was gonna feel bad about that for a while if I didn't finish. It was really bothering me. And I didn't quit school, I quit school I guess because I was bored. I like to say that because it makes me sound really smart and advanced and I was beyond school, but it was more complicated than that. I think the school was doing the best they could do. Um, and I was smart, don't get me wrong. I was very advanced for my age. Um, but I think I just had concentration issues that started in like ninth grade with, with a lot of eating, compulsive eating. You just can't focus. I remember we had a teacher that was teaching us algebra. Did you ever have this experience? where they are teaching 
third, fourth, fifth level things that build off of other things and you have no clue about the first three level things and somehow you miss those, that's like a nightmare. You mm -hmm. ever had a nightmare where they're into higher levels of things and there's a one class that you haven't been to the whole semester? You ever have that dream? I still have that one. Yeah, that me too. Where there's a, some class you didn't get to and it's been going on the whole time and you gotta hurry and get back to it. I, I just had that last week probably. You have that feeling of judgment. Like everyone's like, what a dummy. We're like, oh God, oh God. I, I, and mine is panic. Yeah. Mine is one of panic. Like, wait a minute, I still have to go back to Edgewood High School and figure out and catch up on all the Tuesday science classes I missed and then come to the last one and I've been missing all of these and what have I missed? Will I have enough credits? And I was living that in ninth grade algebra because he was building on this stuff that I just did not remember him covering. So I was blacking out. That proves to me I was blacking out. I feel like I'm having a heart attack right now. I don't, don't, know don't die on the podcast. Please yeah, make don't. sure you get the podcast done first and then do <laughs> get my podcast done first and then do whatever's going on over there. Is your arm getting tingly? No, it okay, was just God. like this sharp pain in my chest all of a sudden I was confused. Okay, don't. Yeah, for sure. Don't die on the podcast. <laughs> so you're you're just you, you wanted to finish something. And it's funny because I can relate to that. I. When I was in high school, yeah. I went to one of those accelerated high schools because I was screwing up my first three years. Mm. And my recruiter basically said, you have to have a high school diploma. If you do a GED, it's just gonna ruin your life. Don't, don't, go, don't, don't go down that road. He was like, just get your, get your high school diploma. To this day, I have stress nightmares where somebody calls me or I get an email and they're like, you never graduated high school. Yeah. You're you're missing a credit. You have to go back that's to a, school. That's it. And it terrifies. I wake up and I'm in a panic. I'm I, I'm the rest of the day. I'm like this ball of anxiety. And I don't it, I don't know what that was, but that's exactly what I'm talking right, about. Right. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And basic training. I, I felt basic training was the same way. Like I wanted to finish something from beginning to end the way it was intended to be done. Not some weird cut corner, not some weird like give me or uh, alternative thing. I wanted to do it and actually do it. I hear you and you know what's funny? That leads me to AO Black. Did you ever hear of AO Black, Area of Operation Black? No, what is that? It was an exercise that we, I was infantry, so I was at Fort Benning. And there was a, a day of something we were gonna do at AO Black. It was a bunch of daytime, high crawl, low crawl stuff that was reportedly terrible. Mm. Everybody was saying, AO Black, that's not, that's the day you don't wanna be there and blah, blah, blah. So I got out of it that day. I was like, I can't go to this. I've been hearing all these bad stories. Why would I go? I wasn't the guy that liked to challenge really all the time. I would try, you know, as I'm telling the story, I'm realizing there were both qualities to me. I wanted to finish it, I guess, on paper, but when it came down to this one challenge, it spooked me out. All the tales mm -hmm. got to me. So I remember I'm on KP duty that day somehow. I, I guess I said I was sick or whatever, but I ended up working in the kitchen that day. And they all came back, and there was a look in everybody's eyes that I had missed something. I had dodged a bullet, and then they didn't like me, and I projected onto them that they didn't have as much respect for me, so I got out of that. I did go to the nighttime fire over there, which was still very inconvenient. I just want to say it was very inconvenient. <laughs> inconvenient. That's that's a great word for a private to describe his training. Like, hey, Joe Sarn, I don't know about this nighttime training, man. This is a uh, pretty inconvenient. Well, let me exactly. You're you're getting it. Let me reveal something to you. <clears throat> when you had talked to me about this podcast, and I was thinking, okay, let me let me listen to the podcast, see what other people are doing, what are they talking about. I went to the army. I got an honorable discharge, okay? But I got in trouble in the army, and that stays with me. It makes me feel less legitimate in some ways. Like I was thinking, he's gonna ask me what units I was in, and I'm not sure I can remember all of them. And I was in the second of the 12th in Colorado, and I was in the first of the 506th in Korea, um, and some other units. I was in the 10th Mountain Division in, in New York. Climb to glory. I, I guess is that yeah. the phrase yeah. is that the phrase for them <laughs> you know because I wasn't like I'm not like a go get like I've got Facebook friends today. I only I only know this because my buddy Ryan Hunt is a hardcore 10th Army guy he started a business around the 10th Army 
like branding. the branding and it's climb to glory. And that's the only reason I know that so I'm not funny. a tenth mountain guy, but whatever. Well, I mean, you know, which of us are these guys and which are not, we're, we're all one, it's we're, a thing. we're all one phrase. Right. We're all one phrase away from seeming like we're part of it. You know yes. what I mean? Curry. Yep. And you would think if I went, Hoo-ah! or whatever, mm-hmm. but it's all a role and it's all what you're taking on and playing and yeah. putting forward as yourself. So I am this, but I'm also not this. It's weird. So I got worried, but I wanted to tell you about being demoted in the army. Can I? Yeah. Um, we were on, we were doing the, the, you know, the, the miles gear. Yeah. The I remember military yeah, in- yeah. interactive laser engagement. Good sy- memory s- system. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's what it stood for. And I thought that was cool. It's this harness for those of you who don't know. Is it just military people? That listen Most, to this? Mostly military. So it's, know. you know, laser tag. It's basically, if laser. you don't know what it is, Google it. It's laser tag. But to get the story though, just understand it's laser tag and we're running around and we're doing military maneuvers, right? Half of our guys are being split up. They're the enemy and I'm the enemy. And, and in this thing, if you get shot, um, your, your harness goes off beep, 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 and you're dead. Now walking around the battlefield willy nilly are higher up people like the first sergeant or the lieutenants or whatever, the company commander. And they will have what's called a God gun, which can activate your stuff. If they just shoot, shoot you with it. Beep, 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 beep. And, uh, okay. So we did a thing we had a maneuver and apparently I, I got shot at one point. And we did the AAR, which is the name of this podcast, which is something I use all the time because I think it's a great for all that might be bad about the military and uh, questionable. They have some great terminology. They do. After action review is a great. And I always use that even for my family today. Let's do an AAR. You know, let's have an after action review because it just gets down to the point of what it is. 100 percent. You know, yep. (laughs) that's why I did it. There's no fat on it. Right. And uh, so so we did this AAR about this thing where I had gotten killed. And our first sergeant, who did not like me at all, I won't even say what his name was, but he was, he was, uh, he was biracial as well. And I always thought maybe there was something he saw in himself, in me, or something. I don't know. I was winning contests on the base for talent and singing, and I would win money, and I would do this stuff. And I don't think he liked the privileges I was getting. I don't know. Could have been something totally different. So we're at the AAR, and we're sitting around, and we're reviewing what and I had gotten on his nerves so many times, we're reviewing what had gone wrong in the AAR, as you do. And he says, he said, uh, he goes, he goes, damn, he goes, uh, damn, specialist, you know, I I would have said, maybe it was corporal at that time, yeah, it was corporal. He said, damn, corporal, you know, I seen this happening and everything, and I I saw the guy come over the hill, I don't see why you didn't see him. And I said, uh, I said, well, you know, everybody's around. I said, well, you know, if you saw him first, Sergeant, why didn't you shoot him? <laughs> <laughs> and for that, I was demoted three uh, levels. He demoted you for that? I got taken up to the higher level. It was like a, a, a uh, brigade, court martial, or, or something, or some kind like of action. Article 15. Article 15, yeah. probably, yeah. And I get demoted. the senior, not commissioned officer. Yep. And I got, I left there in E1. Damn. That was a big pay cut. <laughs> and it was a big, and I still have these nightmares that I am in a uniform. It doesn't have rank on it. And I need to get the rank and I need to get the mud off my boots. So I want to put your, maybe, I hope this helps. Maybe I can, I can help settle some of that anxiety from that experience. My old first sergeant, first sergeant Thaxter, who was alive and well, kicking ass in, in Maryland, uh, he's retired. I remember he once told me there are two types of NCOs. Ones with Article 15s and those who are going to get them. Interesting. Every NCO I've ever met who has been successful in the Army has at least one Article 15. At least Interesting. one. And it's because... They're the outspoken ones. They're the ones who take chances. They're the ones that own up to shit. So when it's like, who did this? Who who wrecked their car? That was me first, Sergeant. Like, oh, Article 15, E5 to E4. I can handle it. I can handle it. And those guys become Sergeant Majors. The good ones do. Interesting. So I had an Article 15. Uh, guess what? 
I still made warrant officer. Wow. Boom. Nice, How do you dude. like them apples, that's Army? That's good. No, that was good for me to hear you say that. Yeah, that's good because I've never given myself that kind of credit or processing really around it. Oh, man. So that, that kind of leads me to something. And uh, I, I know we're pressed for time. But one thing that I've always found interesting about comics when I meet them is how internalized they are. Um, I learned a long time ago that the guy that's on TV is not the guy I'm going to meet. So when I saw it was going to be you were going to be teaching this this uh, workshop, I came with my expectation like he's probably me internalized. And you you met a lot of those expectations in, in, in that respect. A lot of comics do this because of their past. Um, I think I think maybe it was Joe Rogan or somebody along those lines that said no person in the right mind ever becomes a comic. It's just an insane lifestyle. And too much goes into it. Trying to be funny on on command. You can't be a stable, a stable person necessarily to do this kind of stuff. Going through your, uh, you know, through the lens of your addiction, your pre- your previous addiction, your prior addiction, your recovery. Um, how difficult is it? to turn on Barack Obama, to turn on these characters when you yourself seem like a very internalized person, like you seem very, very self-aware, but you don't strike, you're not, you don't strike me. And maybe uh, this is my, uh, maybe I'm being naive because I haven't been around you that much, but you don't strike me as the kind of person who's going to be significantly outgoing alpha person. Hey, what's going on guys? What's happening? That's not, that doesn't seem like you. Mm. Right. Uh, So if I'm understanding the question is, you know, talk to me a little bit about that difference between the performative self and the real self. Is that you just you just outed me as a terrible interviewer, by the way. But yes, (laughs) no, no, (laughs) no, I think your question was good. I just want to make sure that it was it was there was a lot to unpack. Yeah, I just want to make sure I zero in on the part that, you know is going to be, you know, of interest to you. Um, So look, I mean, stop me if I'm not going down the right trail here. Um, When I was leading our workshop yesterday, that's a slightly different persona than, and a slightly different way of being than when I'm doing my show on True TV. I have a show on True TV now where it's called Paid Off. Um, where I do the comedic characters that are in between the questions, paid off with Michael Torpy. Uh, when I'm doing a character on The Tonight Show, and I'm backstage and I'm getting ready, and I'm in the costume, and I got to come out with this burst of energy. What's funny is that ends up being the thing that gets captured on high definition television and pumped out to the world. But it's really only three minutes of my life. A big part of the show business thing for me has been to learn to have a life in between shows and have a life outside of performance. And if you'll notice yesterday during the workshop, I disappeared during the break. You did. Yeah, I did immediately because I have to go. My wife hipped me to this. We led a workshop up north and they came with us and she was, it was before we had our son. So she was helping out with photographs. She was taking photos and stuff. And she said, you just gave and gave and gave and you didn't take a break and you needed water and you were dehydrated and you, you got to monitor that stuff. And I, that was a eye opener to me. That was a real eye opener. Um, cause she was right. And I have learned to use my energy more wisely now. And I go when, I, okay, here's an example. When ASAP invited me to come down here, they said, okay, great. You know, we've got a comedy night on Saturday night that maybe you can go to. And then maybe there's a dinner. They were being so generous and so cool with trying to get me engaged and feeling. But I said, no, th- no, I'm gonna teach this workshop and I'm gonna go collapse at the hotel and then I'm gonna come back refreshed for Sunday. And that's exactly what I did. Because you put so much energy into it. Yeah. And I can see that. You that know, I mean, during, during the workshop, yeah. you were super engaged. And that was something that I walked away with as a podcast interviewer is, uh, and, and I'll be honest with you, I've had a couple of podcast interviews where I, I, I checked out for a minute. I, I, it just what maybe the conversation wasn't right, or maybe my mind was on other things, but I wasn't fully there. Throughout the entire workshop, you were fully. I was watching this, and I'm watching the way that you're 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 listening and you're asking these questions that only a person who's listening to the whole thing. And there were some stories that I wasn't personally interested in, but you were, 
as the instructor, as the as the the the, the workshop leader. Um, yeah, I could definitely see where you need to regain your your energy, as it were. Let me, you know what? Thank you for that observation, and I'm glad that it you know read as you know me caring about it and being there for it, and I and I was, and I work on those skills of being really engaged. I take responsibility for the whole room. I say I'm going to be responsible for this being a safe place, a place that moves forward, that we learn no matter what's happening. We're learning and investigating, and I need to be at the front edge of my investigation too for me to stay interested. That's that's why I ask my real questions. What I learned from my mom not telling me who my real dad was, the message I got was don't ask your real questions. Don't ask your real questions. Ask fake questions that just sort of take up airspace. But I don't do that. If I have a question of someone, I will ask them. And now I'm learning, okay, make sure they feel like they have an out if they don't want to go there. Don't ask twice. Don't press. But it's still okay to look for the truth that you're seeking to be really interested in what you're interested in, you know? What advice do you have for, so right now we're living in this world where veterans are on Instagram, they're on uh, YouTube. They, there are some funny, funny dudes out there that are creating independent content and that are just pumping it out and it's just getting better and better and better, but they're trying to find a way to uh, other roads that lead to the Fallon show, the roads that lead to the true TVs, the roads that lead to to Netflix specials. What is your advice for veterans or for anybody in that matter that are pumping out this kind of content that want to be where you're at and further? Here's something. Just know this. Something occurred to me today, and I don't know if this is a sentimental observation or what, but something occurred to me today after two days of full workshops with veterans. And I'm, you know... I'm just coming into this working with veterans thing and kind of owning this past of mine that I was a veteran and, and I'm going to have similar traits with people who were drawn to that kind of life. As I was watching the workshop today unfold, it occurred to me at one point that veterans are actually a very special group of people. They got involved. They took a risk. They said, I'm going to sign up for this thing, which is historically quite dangerous and very different from my own life. And I'm going to leap in and see where it leads me. It's an adventuresome, pioneering kind of spirit. It's a person who, I'm not going to say in every case, because everywhere people are very different, but there's a basic spirit of entrepreneurial, a, very, a basic entrepreneurial spirit, a basic sense of pioneering and adventure that causes a person, and sometimes, quite often, trouble in the past that causes a person to just fold up and go and say, wherever we're going on this ship, I'm going, you know, or across the world, doesn't matter. And it's also, you've got this group of people that maybe go off to college, which always seems relatively safe when you compare that to going off to the military. And there's a lot to be said for the ones that chose to go and try to stick up for our country because not everybody went why I went just to prove selfishly to prove something to himself and for college money I wanted college money I didn't have any college money and that was a big motivator for me I got lessons that were way beyond some of the things that I got in college very different kinds of life lessons I mean I had a guy um I won't say his name but whatever he was a friend of mine but we were enemies for a while, we got into a fight in Colorado. But he acted like an older brother to me, and he was like, he was correcting me on something. It was correcting me on, uh, it was a small matter of courtesy. And we ended up getting into this little scuffle over it. And then after that, he was uh, like a friend and a mentor. And that kind of brotherhood, that kind of correction, where the organism corrects the individual, you know, is, is valuable, it's valuable. I'm sorry that it gets used to kill people, right? Right. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes, but there is a lot of good that comes out of that kind of fraternity. Amazing. I want to thank you again for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule. You've got to run and catch a flight right after this, but um, your the the ability for you to do what you do is something that a lot of us look up to. Your ability to make people laugh, to bring joy, and to be able to be in the spotlight as a representative of so many of us veterans who wish we could be 
there with you. Thank you. You're very welcome. And you're reminding me with that little follow-up that I actually didn't give a substantive tip for just showbiz ideas. So let me give you this. Sure. Writing, tracking all your ideas, track all your ideas, make a file in your Evernote or your Google Notes and capture every little thing that you think is funny or the kernel of something because you will go back in a year, two years, five years, 10 years, and you'll go, oh my God, look at that little thing I can pull from. Learn joke writing structure. I think uh, Judy Carter's got a great book. There's a lot of ways you can learn this. There's a subreddit for learning stand-up comedy, but be open to learning the classical structure of jokes because it's very informative. Um, work on diction. Work on your diction so the crowd can hear you. Make sure they hear those good ideas because you're ending your words. Some people get sloppy and whatever, and yeah. you just mumble yep. through and you can't hear them. <laughs> but just know this uh, if you're going to do an impersonation of somebody, Barack Obama's voice goes along like this here and then it just falls. It's like a sick bird that's flying all the way to Florida and it gets as far as Georgia and then it just dies. Sometimes he says anything he wants to say, he says things like Republicans, they can just kiss my balls. <laughs> <laughs> all right so what's your what are your pluggables man where where can we uh see you where can we uh follow you on instagram all that other good you stuff you can see me on true tv in uh paid off with michael torpy we just shot some new episodes those will be airing i'm a regular on the tonight show with jimmy fallon and you can go to my website dionflynn.com and find out information about my recovery improv workshops i uh, improv recovery workshops uh, where I work with people who are in recovery and teach them how to use the basic tenets of improv because the basics of improv are the basics of early recovery. Terrific. Uh, and all of those links and more will be in the show notes. Folks, uh, thank you so much, Dion, for being on the show, man. You're very welcome. Thanks again. Folks, thanks for listening. This show runs completely on your support, so be sure to share this podcast with your network of friends, whether it be on LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever social media platform, like, listen, subscribe, and share this podcast. And don't forget to buy veteran business. Put your money where your mouth is, folks. Make sure you're buying from veteran-owned businesses. We're supported and sponsored by the Java Can, 365 Days of Survival, and the Fire Within. All of those links are on our website at theaarpodcast.com. Right there on the landing page, just scroll to the bottom, you'll see them all there. I will see you.